Hey, what's up guys, Matt with The Movement System. In this video, we're gonna talk about how to train like an athlete. Importantly, I'm not just gonna give you a list of random exercises. We're gonna tell you exactly how to execute training in the off season, in the preseason, and in season. And a lot of people make mistakes trying to train in season and end up burnt out instead of maximizing performance. So we're gonna cover how to avoid burnout and maximize performance, and that may surprise you. A lot of the principles that we're gonna cover today come from this book, The Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning, which is the textbook that strength and conditioning coaches learn from, and you may have seen in my other videos. Regardless, by the end of the video, you'll understand how to avoid training mistakes and truly train like an athlete off season, preseason, and in season. Let's go ahead and dive into it. All right, let's go ahead and start with off season training. And I will mention that this is for most field sport athletes. There are some athletes like pure endurance athletes that may train a little bit differently, but most athletes who want to be able to jump high, sprint fast, and express power in their season and in their sport are going to train this way in the off season. And that is to prioritize building lean body mass and size and generally prepare their body. Oftentimes the off season is called the general physical preparation period. This is a great time for athletes to build the size and strength they need to compete at the next level. It's a good recommendation to increase calories during this training time by five to 15% above maintenance so we can build lean body mass because often athletes need more size and strength to compete at the next level. There are a few things that we wanna see with off season training. Number one is that this is typically the highest training volume of the entire year. Because athletes off season aren't competing and aren't doing a lot of sport activities, they can handle more training volume. Even if they're a little bit tired from the gym, it's not going to affect their competition. They're not gonna miss a sprint or miss a goal or miss a rebound because of that. So it's okay to be a little bit tired from training. You can often train three, four, five, six times a week in the gym and often those training sessions are involving five, six, seven, eight exercises. The way that we're gonna typically execute the majority of off-season training is with a little bit longer tempo than we might be seeing in season. So more controlled repetitions, full range of motion, finding a lengthened stretch at the bottom of an exercise, for example, all techniques that are good for building muscle mass. This isn't to say that we can't do any power exercises or sprinting or jumping. It's just that that's not going to be the priority. We wanna have enough time and energy put into building lean body mass, so that becomes our priority, and things like plyometrics and sprinting become more of a secondary priority, and maybe we're just doing that once or twice a week for maintenance, and then we're gonna ramp that up when we get into the preseason next. An example of what an off-season training program might look like is something like this, where we have sets of eight to 12 repetitions. If we're using RPE, we can say seven to eight RPE for our intensity for a lot of this, so that way we can do a high volume of training. So exercises like a chest press or a heel elevated squat might be a good choice. Of course, you can expand on these same principles and choose any exercise that you want. All right, now let's talk about preseason training because this is where it starts to get more fun. In the preseason, we're first building strength, and then learning to express strength quickly. If we're following some of the terminology from the CSCS textbook, the early preseason is more of a basic strength phase, and then late preseason, as we're transitioning into the season, would be called transition one. And that's where we're really emphasizing power and learning to express force quickly. But how do we actually do this? Well, the way that we're assigning sets and reps really matters here. For example, if we want to do three sets of three repetitions, should we choose 87% one rep max, 93% one rep max, or 95% one rep max? Well, it's really important to know how those loads would affect your athlete. For example, if you choose 95% one rep max for three sets of three, your athletes aren't even going to be able to do it. Because typically with 95%, an athlete can only do about two repetitions. If you chose 93%, that's typically right at the maximum that an athlete can do. So that would be a really high strength stimulus. And you would expect the athlete to kind of grind through those repetitions. Maybe that's okay and that's your goal towards the end of a training block or whenever you're really emphasizing maximal strength. But in this program example, what I would choose is 87% one rep max for a front squat for three sets of three repetitions because I know that the athlete is going to be able to complete those and also have good intent and a little bit more bar speed with that movement. This is somewhere between a strength and a power stimulus because they're doing three reps with a five repetition max load. That's because at 87%, the athlete should be able to do about five possible repetitions. If you're only prescribing three, they can move those a little bit faster. It's not gonna be that grinding, 
fifth rep. Again, really important principle to know when you're writing a program for athletes. So some of the principles of preseason training that we wanna emphasize, fast, high intent concentrics, or the shortening or the way up of a bench press or a squat, for example, we wanna maximize that speed. So we're not gonna be doing something like a bodybuilder where they're doing, say, three seconds down, three seconds up, long time under tension type repetitions. That's really not an effective training strategy for athletes, especially in the preseason or in season. We wanna controlled, reasonable eccentric, but not like a slow eccentric, and then a really fast, high intent concentric movement. This is going to maximize power output, maximize explosiveness, and lead to that fast switch fiber activation that we're looking for for our athletes. Relative to what we were doing in the off season, this time period is probably gonna be a little bit lower volume. We're thinking moderate volume, three to four primary exercises, maybe one or two accessory movements. Maybe we're dropping the frequency from say five times a week in the gym down to three or four times a week in the gym because sport training, the amount of time they're spending practicing with their sport coach, for example, is going to be going up here. And we don't wanna overload the athlete with both a ton of resistance training and a ton of sport training. So I've seen some young coaches make this mistake in our program design 101 course, where they wanna choose nine different exercises with three different chest press variations and three different bicep curl variations for a preseason athlete that's just gonna burn them out. Choose one or two of those variations and make it really high intent. And that's going to deliver a lot better results for your athletes. All right, now let's go ahead and cover in-season training. And this is where I think a lot of coaches get afraid because they don't wanna fatigue or burn out their athletes. And maybe they've done that in the past. But if you train the right way, in season, you could still train hard and you can still make progress. First, let's talk about the wrong way to do it. In this study, a group of athletes found their 10 repetition max for the back squat exercise. This is the most amount of weight that they could do for 10 reps. Then they were assigned a training protocol of either three sets of five reps with their 10 rep max, six sets of five reps with their 10 rep max, or three sets of 10 reps with their 10 repetition max. So they did that protocol and then they tested their jump height after the workout, six hours later, 24 hours later, 48 hours later, and 72 hours after doing the workout. What you can see is that there was one protocol specifically that burnt the athletes out and had a significantly decreased jump height for all the way to 72 hours after training. That was the three sets of 10 at 10 rep max. This means that when athletes use such a heavy load that they were training all the way to failure, their jump height was reduced significantly for days after that training session. This is the exact training mistake that you wanna avoid with your in-season athletes. Because if you train these athletes to failure and burn them out, the next 72 hours of sport training and resistance training is not gonna be effective because they have decreased motor unit activation, decreased jump height, decreased performance. So instead, we wanna program maybe something like this. Relatively low volume four sets of three, five sets of two. If they were about to compete, you can even do six sets of one, three sets of two. It could be really low volume, but with really high intent. Also, the intensity that we're using, we don't want it to be an intensity that they could barely do. As a rule of thumb, if you're doing five repetitions, you probably want around a 10 repetition max load. If you're doing, say, three repetitions, you probably want around a six rep or an eight rep or even a 10 rep max load, but moved very fast. 60% looks a little bit low, but that's because we're also adding bands. Regardless though, the principle that you wanna get right with in-season training is explosive movements that are not to failure, high intent, low volume. If you do all those things right, you're gonna have your athletes feeling fresh and performing at their best. All right, and then lastly, there's post-season. This often gets ignored, but I think it's actually a good time to introduce movement variability. Maybe this means some stability exercises. Maybe this means some isometrics to build back up athletes' patellar tendons who did a ton of jumping and kind of beat up their body throughout the season. So here's an example of what post-season training might look like. Maybe an isometric quarter squat, maybe an uneven push-up, and then maybe some ankle stability drills or something like that. Overall, the goal of this video wasn't to tell you exactly what to do but rather to teach you the principles so that way you can choose your own individual exercises and coaching style to meet your athletes' needs. If you do want to learn more about how to write great strength and conditioning programs, you can check out Program Design 101. That is our full course for strength and conditioning coaches to learn how to write great programs for their clients and athletes. By the end of the course, you'll see multiple program examples. You'll have written multiple programs yourself that you can immediately use with your clients and athletes, and you'll earn continuing education units for maintaining your CSCS certification. Also, I'll leave a link in the description below to download a free program template if you're interested in just practicing yourself. All right, thanks so much for watching, guys. Subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, and we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks.